Hi everyone, welcome to Open Hour. I'm really excited for this month's topic. Um, we're talking about new contributors and contributions to open source code. Um, so for just a little bit of background for those of us who are new to Open Hour, um, we host Open Hour once a month. Um, it's normally the first Monday of every month and we rotate the times uh, a little bit. So I apologize for anyone whose timing I messed up with our daylight savings mess going on here in the US. Um, but <laughs> thank you so much for coming and we'll probably get a couple drop-ins um, as we continue to go along today. Um, but so just a little bit about this topic. Um, so Public Lab is, bit, is an open source project that we've um, that has been going for a while now but one of the things that's been really neat in the past I don't know Jeff what do you say six or eight months um, there have been a lot yeah. of new contributors to the public lab code base. So this is something that we just wanted to get together on and celebrate um, and talk a little bit about some of the successes for that and how, how we can make that um, more possible for more people to come in and contribute on publiclab.org. Um, so that's a little bit of background for me about this particular topic on Open Hour. And Open Hour changes every month in terms of what topic we have. Um, but Jeff, if you want to give a little bit more information about like what we've seen on Public Lab and what might cause this or um, other topics for, for today. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think uh, if, you, if you go to the site and uh, the publiclab.org slash tag slash software outreach, software dash outreach, there's actually a really good um, set of posts over the course of, well, really from the beginning and, and then at the end of this process that we've been engaging in. The, the, the beginning really started with uh, help from folks at SpinachCon, which was a, um, a, an event to try to make your software easier to install for newcomers. And uh, then another one uh, where I, I heard uh, a member of the Hoodie team. Speak. And, um, really got introduced to this idea uh, and this, this sort of movement, movement that's emerging in open source software, which is kind of called the first timers only movement. Uh, I mean, it's not really a movement, except that I don't know what, el what else to call it. Um, it's a set of very uh, specific practices oh, to welcome newcomers. Phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, basically like a number of people have started doing this. There has been convergence around specific tags to welcome in newcomers. And specifically, uh, this this practice of making some issues that uh, you're not allowed to take on unless it's your first time, uh, and and really putting an extraordinary amount of extra uh, welcoming and sort of uh, to, you know uh, a positive uh, inclusive tone into these, uh, and doing so as an explicit part of uh, uh, reaching a more uh, diverse contributor base. Um, and really not looking on GitHub necessarily for new contributors or in existing open source communities, but looking outside of those uh, sort of uh, usual spaces. And uh, Hoodie has done such a good job and they continue to do such a good job that we, we can just keep learning from them. But, um, but sort of as I uh, talk about in some of those and in, in an upcoming post on the Google Summer of Code blog, I think it'll come out the end of November actually, um, there's sort of two parts. One is just making your code incredibly easy to install. Uh, and we did that pretty quickly after, after the, you know, spinach con and hoodie contacts we had. And then, then it was sort of like the harder part, which is like going into your issues, the issue listing and pulling out ones that don't just say this is broken or what if we did this or sort of like speculate without an, an actual next step and finding ones or, or working to make ones that really have like a link to where something is in the code, uh, an idea of what could be done, uh, like a really concrete next step, uh, as well as just sort of, uh, uh, you know, a specific call out, help wanted, you know, like we, we really would love someone to take this on. This isn't just a note to self that we're going to fix this later. And, and, and acknowledging that you need some basic contextual information to do that. And that has been, a lot of work, but it's also been, I think, the most successful thing we've ever done. I, I posted in this most recent one, uh, this, there's a post called Bridges Between Our Community and Our Software Contributors. And I just noted that um, since August 1st, which is only the last uh, three months, 
Uh, we've had 57 new contributors. Uh, that's people who have uh, created issues or coded or, you know, any of the above. And that's out of a total of 147 for the lifetime of the project, of, uh, which of about four years. So one third, more than one third of our contributors joined in the past three months. And I, I really like that. And I like the diversity of people who are coming. And uh, I'm looking sort of like to how to scale this up a little bit. Cool. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for the background. Um, I was wondering if we could go around a little bit and say who we are and where we're calling in from and maybe what, what got you interested in connecting today on OpenR. Um, so I'll, I'll start and then we can just sort of um, go around. I don't know if you, you all see the same screen that I, screen, <laughs> I see in terms of our order. But, um, so I'm Stevie Lewis and um, I'm calling in from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and I think like one of the things that really got me interested in this particular topic was um, sort of that boom that Jeff is talking about in, in new contributions and new contributors. Um, and I'm also really excited about the diversity of people that we're seeing um, on contributing on Public Lab. Um, I am personally not a coder, so I also get really excited about um, talking about how non-coders can contrib contribute to sort of like the conversation about design interface on Public Lab. Um, so that's a little bit about me and my interests. Um, Liz, you, do you want to go? Me? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm just going backwards. <laughs> I don't know what order all the screens show for everyone, but um, uh, my name is Liz, and I happen to be sitting with Stevie in New Orleans right now, but normally <laughs> I live in New York City. Uh, I'm down here for the annual barn raising. And um, I, I'm mostly excited to meet new people. Like, I'm really excited to meet you here on the call. Um, you three here, and I think we just had someone join. So to the new person who's joining, um, we're just doing introductions right now, and um, we'll go through and ask you to introduce yourself too. Um, but um, yeah, um, I'm looking forward to on this call to hearing um, what each of you um, new contributors, um, what was your your interest and motivation, and then what did you actually do because you've all actually made contributions already. Um, yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, let's see. Why? What's it? Why KL seven? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, I think I'll just change my name there. But yeah. So uh, actually, I've been working with uh, open source for about a year and a half now. Um, probably a little longer. But the thing is, I've done iOS. I've done Python. I never uh, uh, ventured into Ruby or proper web development. So I went about finding uh, projects on GitHub that I could actually start with. And a lot of those gave me issues that I could not understand at, at all. I, I literally had to search through first timers and easy and simple bugs to get stuff that I would actually understand on the first attempt. And uh, through and through, I got to plots uh, somehow. And there, uh, I think the first issue was, I think it, it was a one line change for some CSS edit that Jeffrey basically posted the answer to. So at least it, it got me started with something. And I, I could try something new, just check out what Ruby could do and how you could work, work with it. And that's basically what I've been doing for a while now. Awesome, and where are you calling in from? Um, I'm from Manipal. Uh, actually, I'm in college right now. I'm a third year student in Manipal Institute of Technology, the fake MIT, basically. It's India. India. I don't know that that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have the right to call it that. <laughs> so it's very, very advanced technology that you have going on there, huh? <laughs> yeah. Basically. Great. Awesome. Great. Um, Austin. Hi. Yeah, I, uh, so I'm in New York right now, um, just north of the city. I'm in Beacon. Uh, Oh, that is so awesome. Yeah, it's weird. Like in the last few years, like all of a sudden everybody knows where Beacon is. It's kind of cool. Uh, it used to be I had to say, oh, you know, Poughkeepsie and then pretend I was from there. Um, yeah, so I've been, um, I've been just kind of coding around messing with Python for the last like year or so. And then uh, I ended up at a coding boot camp for the past few months. 
Um, and that was awesome. Uh, we learned a lot of Ruby and I taught myself JavaScript while I was there. And uh, I've just been kind of building stuff. And uh, we had a teacher who really encouraged us to get into open source. Um, so my first open source contributions were like contributing to like the docs for a video game API, but I wanted to do something a little more useful. Um, so I knew I could probably help out with some Rails stuff if I found some Rails things to contribute to. Uh, and I think just while I was searching for like help wanted for Ruby stuff, uh, this was the project. This is one of the projects that popped up at the top. And uh, I contributed, I think it was like issue 941 uh, or something, uh, sorting the activity grid by likes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks. So, yeah, that was like a one, it was a kind, of, kind of like um, what Yash uh, now has his name, uh, kind of like what he did. Yeah. Was one you, you got it close enough. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it was one line, but because it's Rails, I had to spend, you know, sorting, th I had to sort through like 40 different parts of the file tree to make sure that the thing I was changing was what I thought it was. Um, <laughs> and so I spent time just kind of staring at the schema, making sure I understood what was a property of what. And... Um, yeah, so I changed that one line, and now the activity grids are sorted by likes. Awesome. Thank you so much. That, that was one of my favorites. Sorry to cut in, but Liz posted that, mm. and you solved it, I think, within like two hours of her posting the bug. Yeah, it I was just amazing. Happened, yeah, no, I just happened to have like gotten there, and I saw like the issue was posted. It was like eight minutes ago when I first got to the page. <laughs> and I was like, oh, crap. Okay, like I guess I'll, I'll look really awesome if I change this soon. <laughs> <laughs> that, you were wrong. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, so Riza, Riza Kukin, is that how you say? Can you unmute and tell us? Yes, I'm Ujwal. I'm from New Delhi, India. And from where? India? New Delhi. Oh, New Delhi. You say great. And I'm, I'm like, I like, like to learn web development. And Plots was basically when I was looking for projects to work on, I found a few help wanted issues that Jeffrey had like intentionally posted to get people into the code base and with a little motivation, you know, there's a barrier which you need to break uh, when you look at a new code, ba code base and, you know, know the ins and out of how it works and with a little motivation now, you know, I'm up and running. Awesome. Cool. That don't, I wanted to know, sorry, I keep butting in, but it's so great to hear people's actual voices. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention, um, you've actually uh, now made your own first timers only issue, which itself has been claimed and then solved as of, I think this morning. Oh, so that was just really cool too. Yeah. So oh, thank you. Awesome. That, that was really epic. That's so cool. What was um, what was the issue you worked on first? Uh, the issue I worked on first was perhaps like adding a redundant questions, you know, text when yeah. you post a question. It uh, already uh, when you open the questions posting page, it already had a redundant question, you know, text written on it, and most people would leave it as is. So we removed it and. It okay. was a basic issue, but you know, it helped me get started. Yeah, cool, awesome, great. Um, yeah, so I guess I we put a couple questions out there um, in terms of some things to talk about if people are interested. But I guess you know, just getting together in person, this is sort of an organic thing as well. So if anyone has um, questions or comments or suggestions or things we want to talk about, um, go ahead and, and throw them out there. Otherwise, we can start going through some of the things that we put out on the open hour um, call for. I really wanted to talk about the chatting solution. Some, you know, uh, if we utilize some chatting platform like Gita, we, we would seem more approachable to new contributors. Like, I talked to Jeff about this and he said, no. Like a, a, a chat platform for people who are contributing on the code base? Is that what you're talking about? 
Yes, uh, basically a chat platform where newer contributors could, you know, contact the developers and everything. But, you know, the chatting platform could transcend just development if we use something universal for like, you know, the organizational chatting needs. It could serve the development process as well. Yeah, there is a there is a chat on <clears throat> on the public lab um, on the website. Um, it's not in my like from what I've seen, it's really not used very much. Um, and I'm not sure. I guess I would be interested in hearing um, if that's something that we should put a link to on GitHub. Yeah, there's an IRC. Um, and also, we had a Gitter for Google Summer Code. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say oh. as well. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. So yeah, and then when we did Google Summer of Code, um, the students created a room um, to collaborate with some of their mentors on and each other, um, which was really great um, to 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 see them have their own space to talk to. So. I think there's a couple of things that we have tried, and um, I would be interested in hearing like from from those options and other possibilities out there what would work best. Uh, I think Google Groups can also be a solution if, uh, and I think Plots has a Google Groups, but uh, I'm not sure how active it is. So uh, a lot of uh, channels and a lot of uh, projects they use either Google Groups or IRCs because IRCs are still a little tricky for people who are starting out. You still have to explain to them how the entire thing works, but Google yeah, Groups yeah. is pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing yeah. about IRC is uh, that it you know at IRC if you see there's seven eight people online, a few of them are bots. So IRC doesn't maintain logs. If I wanted yeah, to convey yeah. something, I, I if I needed to post something, and you know if if I put it on GitHub, some will. Someone will eventually get to see it, but that's not yeah. a necessity. Yeah. IRCs are pretty tricky that way. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I was curious. I mean, Gitter. I, I noticed you can go and when you go, you know, just fresh to the to Gitter. Im, it it asks you if you want to sign in with GitHub or with Twitter, and I don't know if that. Uh, I mean, one thing is we try to avoid having too many different places that you have to have a username. And so that, you know, given that many people would have Twitter accounts and then at least for the people who are code contributing, you might have a GitHub account. That seems reasonable. Uh, one thing that I've been thinking of, though, is, um, you know, it, it, I, I feel like we are trying to reach uh, some people who aren't necessarily coders uh, to be involved. And we don't know yet how what that's going to look like. Um, I, I guess in some ways we may be just assuming that everyone would get a GitHub account to become involved, even if they're not coders, but I don't know if that's a big assumption. Um, and, and there has been sort of a suggestion also of having some of the, the, the development and the design work happening like in the public lab website, things like that. But I would agree, yeah, the, the, the Plot Dev Google group is one that we've, lo we've long sort of had, but it's never really been that active. And, and so maybe, you know, maybe what, what you folks are saying is really correct that um, for whatever reason, it's either not highlighted enough or it's not used enough or doesn't seem welcoming enough. Um, so, so another solution might be, uh, might be nice. Mm. Um, I guess one, one of the things that just crossed my mind when you said the non-code contributors and having a GitHub account, is it possible to set up like a push system um, from public lab onto github so that you wouldn't need it in account I don't think um, so unfortunately github is a little bit tight on their the, the way that they manage logins um, Yeah, they, they so. have a proper OAuth protocol that you can't circumvent gotcha bummer <laughs> Yeah, it's too bad. I feel the same way in some cases about like, you know slack uh, uh, You know, but I wonder yeah, I mean there's a little bit of research, but I, I think that there might be some limits to what we could do in that respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, one thing to consider is, uh, you know, we've we've raised the idea of um, of doing like some kind of community chat channel. I don't know if that would be at odds with a more software-oriented one. I guess there could be different rooms. But at the very least, maybe we wouldn't like 
make two new kind of channels with, on different platforms. So I don't know. Yeah. Do you want to talk about Slack? Um, Riza Kukin mentioned Slack, and a lot of people have been asking about Slack. Um, I'm in probably like six different Slack groups right now. Um, I mean, it's, I don't know, a lot of people ask before, I just wonder how long it's going to be around. Um, and if it's really a lot better than, um, I guess it is a lot better than email. I'm not even going to ask that rhetorically. <laughs> but, um, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the same question about longevity could be true about Gitter. Gitter looks really nice, and it seems to be relatively close to Slack. Uh, but again, is it around for a while? And then just to throw one more in the mix, there's a one called uh, Discourse, which is actually open source uh, and has a very strong, um, you know, software contributor base. They're actually also a Ruby on Rails project. And I met the Discourse people at the Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit. Well, um, I mean, it, I know, like, when we started our Google forums and as we're now adding more like comments, um, like commenting features to publiclab.org, on the website and essentially moving our forum type conversations from email list to there. I feel like we've since years ago we've made we've made a decision that would move us away from discourse, which other communities use as a forum solution. Hmm. Oh really? Wait, in what way? So so just to say that again, like other communities use forum use discourse as a solution for their forums. But when we years ago have like we've already been having like a system of Google groups and now we're looking to basically move all of that over into the website directly, like that's uh, like so this course would be um, uh, what's it called? Like a duplicate of those functions. Hmm. Oh, you're saying this course is more like a forum and less like a chat. Yeah, this course is a forum. Hmm. Okay. Um, I was actually, Riza Kuk and I, I was really <laughs> excited that you put up that Gitter seems really developer-y. So I think that's like a real, that's a really important point. If we're looking for people who aren't doing a lot of code contributions, you know, or don't really see themselves in that kind of realm, are we looking for a space for them to feel comfortable in contributing, or is it a space for specifically for developers? In which case, that wouldn't be as much of an issue. I, I think like I'm falling on the side of let's have a, a space that's more comfortable for more people. Um, so what are, what were your impressions from Gitter that made you say that? I mean, a lot of open source organizations use that, including Free Code Camp, but uh, most of their activities are you know confined to the technical side of things, to the code side of things. But if we need an all-in-all -all solution for our chatting needs, then maybe you know, other people won't like Gitter that much because it's so intrinsically linked with GitHub at times you, you've got to think about it too. Gotcha. But can you sign up without a GitHub user account? You can sign up with a Twitter account, but you know, Slack has activities and stuff that GitHub was uh, created for GitHub uh, communities, for open source communities, but for other scientific communities, it won't function that well, I think. What was that, Liz? Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh, sorry. I think it, I just wanted to ask um, him if he likes Slack. I say I use Slack. No, I, I, I haven't really used it for any real projects, but it looks promising. Um, just to pitch in, I have actually used Slack and uh, it, it completely depends on the people that are on there. Even if you post whatever problems you have, unless there is someone else logging in and people really don't use the mobile app, they have to use a desktop for whatever reason and they don't answer your questions or you're just left hanging there for like a week or so and then you figure out something else to do entirely. So Slack is an option, but uh, I think it's a little 
primitive i would say i'm not mm. sure what the word would be for it but yeah because most organizations have been using slack or irc or google groups right but we want to go towards a non developer side and all of the solutions that we're thinking are still very uh, like they're leaning towards the technology and the developer area of the contributor base mhm i think um and so like what you're saying right now one of the things that we do we have already is the developers google group for public lab um yeah. which i think you know it, it's i don't have the activity on it i think it's it's fairly active but it's like there's responses fairly regularly when someone posts something so yeah. there's not like a lot of silence you're not going to lose an issue when someone you know posts out a message on the the slot, the plots dev list and email is expected to be asynchronous and messages are better logged yeah which yeah i'm also really old though so i'm like yeah email already works and <laughs> 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 Yeah, um, so I think that, uh, you know, demographically, the people under the age 18, most of them don't have email accounts, right? <laughs> no, I don't think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's true. What? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hey, I, I actually, I had a, a thought maybe that applied. Yeah. <laughs> As always. Um, I, uh, I was thinking, uh, I, I've been posting a little bit here and there about different strategies and and one thing I wanted to talk about a bit later maybe or in a different time would be like second timers only issues because <laughs> I hear a lot from people what would be the next thing you did after the first one um and I've been sort of responding one on one to one some of those requests but another thing uh is actually more related to this question of platforms and, and chat and and sort of forums which is um I recently emailed out to our organizers about um, whether some people would be available to be helpful or supportive to, to um, if we posted some of the issues in other languages. And we, I specifically said Spanish because we have some people who are coders who speak Spanish on our organizers list. But it, it brought to mind, I wasn't sure how to get that going. I mean, beyond just creating an issue that is in Spanish. Um, because when I asked the organizers, whether they would be supportive or be helpful, what exactly was I asking? And so I then really started to think about what are the different types of, of you might call it mentoring, like not as in-depth as mentoring a Google Summer of Code project for the whole summer, but what are some of the different roles that people could play? And what are, like, we might have some people who have a busy job and they can only check in once a week for an hour uh, at a scheduled time. Is there something they can do, or is there someone who can't really do large bodies of work but might be able to swoop in and and help someone solve a problem if they're really stuck at one moment? Is you know are there people who could sort of offer ideas about how to plan out your code, but you know wouldn't be able to help you debug it? And I realize that a lot of these are sort of different roles, and and you know whether or not we choose a new chat platform or, or use the existing IRC or, you know, the Google groups or whatever, it occurs to me that, that as we ask people to begin helping others, uh, whether they are people who've been on a community a long time or whether they're recent first timer contributors who have now become like, uh, you know, created their own first timer issues and so forth. Mm -hmm. it, I, it would be interesting, I think, to really articulate out what are these different specific things that people might agree to do. And then, you know, you, you've, I'm sure you've all seen on GitHub, if you're subscribed to stuff, there's a constant chatter and it can be quite distracting. You know, like this morning I woke up and like one of the first things I did was I looked and said, oh, there's a first timer contributor asking a question. We've got to answer that. And so before I had breakfast and my brain, my brain was not really 100%, I was like in there trying to respond on my phone. And then I hit the wrong button and I, I, I think I scared them because I actually closed the oh, issue. Yeah, and they're I like, saw that. No, I saw that. I, it was a totally a mistake, and they were like, "Why did you close my issue?" Oh no! So, and I, I said, "Oh, I'm on my phone. I'm sorry. I just clicked the wrong button, uh, and I undid it. So that's fine." But uh, you know, if we ask people, "Hey, uh, would you uh, be able to just leave your IRC, you know, or your Slack channel open, whatever it is, and and just say hi to people, uh, and just make sure that they aren't asking a question and getting getting silent." Mm. Um, or maybe connect them with other people who have who, who can help them choose an issue. 
or who can help them plan out a, a, a small project. Just stuff mm-hmm. like that, you know, and then someone who is going to just, maybe someone else who will just ignore all the traffic and only respond if, if they've sort of re- specifically requested to participate in something. Um, and they do that just once a week or once, once a month. You know, that, those sort of, I, I think we can get more people involved if we, if we clearly laid out those sorts of roles and responsibilities. Mm-hmm. You got, um, I, I think you're on your phone, so you might not have seen this, but when you were talking about like the second timers only, there was some support written in for writing up those as help wanted issues. Yeah. Sorry, just yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. to fill in what you might have missed. <laughs> Yeah, and, I, and I, I know I've been talking a lot, but just to add one more thing, there's sort of an intermediary can, uh, category that was created a few days ago, which is, uh, you may have noticed, it's called FTO candidate. And it's intentionally not, it's intentionally a little obscure because we didn't want actual first timers to think that they were ready, like as a completely first timer issue. But they're ones which we've sort of marked that could, could with some extra formatting be made into a first timers issue. Uh, and, and so I, I've actually been starting to point some people at those, point people at the help wanted items, but FTO candidate are ones that need a little extra work, but they're, they're not a huge project. They're just something that we could reformat in nicely into a first time only issue. And if we're like, we're right now, we're out of open first time only issues. Both of them are claimed. And I think both of them are actually <laughs> solved, which is great. But, but we could point people at FTO wow. candidates if, if there's nothing else, you know? Yeah. I wonder if there's like a way to, I mean, you, you seem to be doing this on like a one-on-one basis, but um, once people to get, get comfortable to sort of have that funnel of, okay, now you've done a first timers only issue. You've been, you know, contributing for a certain amount of time. Like at what point are you comfortable to, to write a first timers only kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been, yeah, yeah, you're right. I've been doing them one at a time. I do have this, I don't know if folks are aware of this in GitHub, but there's this um, save replies feature. So as I realized, I've sent a lot of similar emails uh, or similar responses. I've been saving some of them. And I, so it just helps me have all the links, you know, to thank people and so forth. Um, I can share out that list as well. Yeah. So I'm, I was curious to hear um, from you guys, like after you did your first your first contribution and did the first timers only like did you look for other issues after like did you feel was it enough that you felt confident to take on a second issue that maybe wasn't a first timers or is there like a a middle step there I don't know I I don't do this I don't really know like how far does that get you past the barrier that's that was already there to, to, to go on and contribute more Uh, so when I did, uh, I think uh, it was a, I, uh, two, two and a half months ago that I tried to solve the first issue I had. Um, after that, I did try try out two more and I sent pull requests for the same. But the thing is, there, uh, there had to be like one issue, at least after the first one, that uh, it took me that amount of time to get through the entire code base stuff that uh, I was requ- required to change because the first time I was getting used to the contributing guidelines themselves because every, uh, as far as I understand, every repository works a different way. Uh, every organization wants a different structured code. So the first come first pull request for me was to get through that. And then I, it took me another and now I'm looking at help wanted issues like Jeffrey suggested uh, so that I can actually work on slightly bigger things and get it better. That's so cool. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I, I, uh, I just happened to, I was like looking for different projects just so, you know, I didn't have too much of Ruby. Uh, so I was in different repos mostly and I haven't, I haven't come back to plots just yet. Mm-hmm. But just like um, scrolling through, um, yeah, it's just kind of, um, I, I think the first timers only thing it's like a nice entry point, but then after that, you immediately have to be more courageous. You immediately have to take on something that is um, uh, more substantial. Um, and that's fine. Like, there's no, that's programming, I guess, you know what I mean? And uh, 
I think sometimes you want to be greedy and take the easy problem and just be like, yeah, I solved it. But, uh, you you kind of have to you have to be brave. Um, so I've been kind of scrolling through, poking around, but I'm looking forward to doing something a little more substantial. Um, I wonder if there's something, and well, that makes me think like, you know, the help wanted, are all the help wanted things that are listed sort of like that next step where they wouldn't be as challenging as like some of the wide open issue? I guess I'm wondering like what makes something a help wanted issue? Well, from this is Jeff. Uh, I, I think <coughs> help wanted was like, uh, not as high a standard uh, or as rigorous a standard as first timers only. In first timers only, you, you literally are trying to guide someone through every single step because it, as a newcomer, those steps are probably completely confusing and unknown. <laughs> so the, in a sense, like first timers only often is not actually even asking someone to solve a problem. It's asking someone to go through the process so that they know what that process is like. So I think that's really powerful, and it's sort of a different thing. Whereas Help Wanted, uh, I personally, I know other people may have been using Help Wanted uh, in different ways. I've been using it as like uh, there is at least one link into the source code as to where this issue is so that you have a place to start. Because the source code as a whole is a lot of code. It's hard to sort through. So there's at least one, if not more, links into the source code for where this begins. And there's some kind of clear direction that, that like a solution proposed. It doesn't have to be listed every point, but it should be like, you know, I'm looking at one here that's like, um, I don't know, uh, display an alert on candidate activity posts with a prompt to adapt them. And it's listed help wanted. And, um, you know, I, I think it, it sort of says like, well, you could show a, like a div alert on this line. You know, and, and it doesn't have all the steps laid out the way the full first timers only would have, but it, it has, it's not, it has to be more than just saying, um, what if we did this? It has to actually specify, you know, a, a really concrete change. Because I know a lot of issues when people put them up there, they're either like, um, oh, there's something wrong, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have a solution. It's just a sort of a, a recognition that something's wrong, and that's helpful. Uh, or it may be sort of an idea for a, a feature and it may not be fully imagined out, you know, it may need some additional thought by someone who uses the site a lot. So that neither of those are really good help wanted, even though they're really helpful, but, but, but there's no, from someone outside to come in, those are hard to take action on, you know? Mm-hmm. And maybe the, with a, with an, another couple steps, you know, someone who knows the code a bit, like myself coming in and just dropping a line of code in there and saying, hey, look here. And then someone, someone, any, really anyone who is familiar with publiclab.org saying, yeah, that would be a good idea, or we could try this, and, and putting a specific proposal out. And then it can be marked help wanted, and, and maybe even first time around the candidate if it's not a very big project. Um, so uh, I think I'll, I've been sort of trying to dig through the really old issues uh, and either close them out or, or try to put in just that one line of code and sort of a step forward and mark them help wanted. Because, I mean, you know, it seems like we could try to get most issues in some way to have a next step. Maybe not completely solve the problem, but at least take that one step forward, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, and I also added um, another label recently, just trying this out, but I noticed some issues really are like two or three different issues. So they have two or three different problems or, or maybe a solution in three parts. And I just started adding, it takes time to break those up. So I just added a tag or a label called break me up. <laughs> um, well, you know, the idea that if you want to try to get a first timer only uh, issue out of it, you could sort of peel off a small chunk of that of that issue and make it into a first time as well. I think one one of the things that struck when you said, I was asking like a little bit of clarification about help wanted, it's almost like help wanted for who? Like with the intent of, am I, cause I could put something as like, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm on public lab. I run into a bug, and I I submit the bug, and I'm like, I actually need help. Like, I have help wanted <laughs> to get over whatever this bug is that I've run into. So, 
I, there, I'm kind of wondering about like if there could be a little bit more clarification in terms of like what those specific tags are. So like, I know you said like different community groups are using it a little bit differently, but if we have a couple of different things, you know, written out, like, I mean, obviously that would be written in as a bug. Like if I ran into something on a website that was broken and, um, but if there's the, just that, it seems like there's not really um, enough words on, on public lab in terms of what those tags are, or maybe there aren't enough tags to say like how much information would be in, or how much, how much background you would have to have, or how much experience you would have to have in this thing to be able to solve this particular issue. It seems like there's like help wanted could cover like a wide range of that. Yeah, and maybe Jeff, we need to. Respond, I also wanted to add in that um, Rizokukin has put in chat that only a maintainer can add the help wanted tag. So then it's got um, it's a bit of limited use in that way. Mm -hmm. Is that just on public? Yeah, that's, Is that everywhere? That's, that's everywhere. everywhere. Um, yeah. And, and I've begun adding people as uh, collaborators, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, 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 we just don't have a good, we haven't thought through how that's going to work, but I, you know, I noticed that uh, you, know, you can't be assigned a, a thing sort of to claim it unless you're a collaborator, so I just added everyone as a collaborator. <laughs> and uh, you know, as people begin to create issues and help to categorize them, maybe we should sort mm -hmm. of have a, a check-in every month and say, is anyone interested in taking on a little extra responsibility to help tag things? Um, you know, I, I I would be happy to create that as long as people sort of we're all on the same page about what the tags mean, um, more or less. But yeah, I, I think that's. Uh, I, I'm aware people can't necessarily tag their own, and I think it's helpful for people who who, who have that privilege, like Stevie and Liz, who who have who are maintainers. To, to be aware that not everyone else has those uh, uh, as well. It's not necessarily clear in the interface that you have the special privilege, but, uh, mm. but you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> what other things, I was wondering, um, with some of the other communities that you've, um, that people have contributed in on, what are some of the neat or useful things that you've seen other, other groups do? Well, maybe that's a good question for other folks on the call. I, I, I'd love to hear you, how, how we sort of compare and relate to other yeah. projects that you worked on. Yeah, Yash started responding. Yeah, so most of the work I've done, like I said, it's been iOS or Python. Uh, none of the communities are that uh, welcoming on their GitHub um, forums. Like I've talked to a lot of uh, people in the Python community in India. I know a lot of them personally. But when you start out contributing on GitHub, on the repositories, repositories uh, it's not uh, very open. You, like, uh, you guys have a first time is only thing, or Jeffrey added the FTO candidate. Uh, there it's just help wanted. So I just, uh, that's the first thing I searched for everywhere. Just look through a help wanted, figure out what mm -hmm. I need to do. I, I can ask questions, obviously, but it's not laid out as... Um, well uh, here uh, it's not laid out as well in other projects as it is here it's uh, you have like um, Mozilla has it laid out well but going through their issues is another big deal in itself um, but generally projects don't have as much of a like uh, welcoming feel ab about them yeah I, uh, I definitely want to echo that um, I've worked on other projects where even when they're welcoming, the like the technology stack is not as welcoming. So like the installation instructions, very clear and all in one place. That's and you guys did a great job on that. Uh, another project I've been contributing to, literally, I just keep pushing what I think is the fix, but I don't actually know because I can't run the tests on my computer. Um, I can't. I just can't get them installed. It's like it's been. I spent more time trying to get the thing installed than I spent making the change. Um, and it's just been, it's just been awful. <laughs> like, uh, I also had to learn Golang and they tag it. Oh. Yeah, they tag it as a JavaScript issue. So that was really great. Uh, but, uh, that's fine. Uh, By really great, I'm guessing you mean not great at all. <laughs> yeah, no, totally, totally sarcastic. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> the tags here. 
like you, it's actually clear, right? When I search for something that's in Ruby, I'm going to be working in Ruby. That's also really good. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so be careful on the tagging. <laughs> yeah, no, you guys are doing great on tags, especially like language tags and stuff, so. Cool. Is there anything else you guys have seen in other places or, or struggled with in other places that we should keep out an eye out for? Um. I'm curious about the um, like the test and Jeff, this is something I always hear Jeff talk about and I don't really I know what it is like it's so that things don't get broken when you change make a change right to the code base is that right mm -hmm. yeah um, so what's that process like for for you as a contributor um, on for uh, I think you guys have Cloud9 and a local setup both as options. So the first time I was trying to install, uh, I'll get it running. Mm -hmm. I tried Cloud9 and apparently they need a credit card, uh, which in India is a big deal to have. So I tried a debit card instead and they rejected it. So I had to manually install everything on my system and that <laughs> took a long time. What needed a credit card? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure why uh, I, I, they're asking me to register a credit card. They don't charge you or anything, but they want a credit card on file or something. Who did? Cloud9. Cloud9. Huh. Yeah. I uh, haven't had that experience, but I can look into that. That, that would be unfortunate. I'm not. Yeah, because when you guys listed it, I'm, I, I was pretty sure you must have thought of something when you did that. But, uh, so I, I just left it alone. I installed everything on my system. So um, I have to do all that, all that locally and get it done. But, yeah, I know. <laughs> but Travis CI is really good. Uh, uh, actually, I have to ask, how did you guys manage to do that? To do which, sorry? Uh, Travis CI integration. Oh, uh, that was a part of our summer uh, work. Um, Sebastian uh, Silva, who uh, is our sysadmin, uh, got that all running. Uh, and it was a real priority for us because, uh, in theory, people don't have to actually install the software, which is, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you, uh, it, it, having to push up a new set of changes every time to see if they work is not ideal, and you don't get to try it out in an interface. But, I mean, for a small change, you could actually just make the change and then push it up and see if all the tests pass, um, yeah. which I think is kind of cool. Uh, yeah, it's re it's really been helpful and we used to have over the summer Tuesday and, and Friday sort of merge schedules and now I can be much more confident I look at this and if it pass all the tests and I, I can often just say okay I'll pull it in. Mm. Good. Travis here is a great integration to the project. Um, did other people I'm just curious uh, did other folks uh, outside the US have uh, uh, encounter a request for a credit card in Cloud9? Uh, I'm wondering if that's something related to, you know, being in the U.S. or out. I didn't, but I didn't, but maybe that's because I have a student account. Yeah, even yeah, I have yeah. that, but uh, I'm not sure what is happening. I'll try to check it out again. Okay. Yeah, I would love if 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 that becomes an issue, if that really uh, is, is is you know uh, maybe it's a new thing. I don't know, but we should um, find a way around it because that, that that's unfortunate. Seems unreasonable. Yeah, I don't like the sound yeah. at all. I don't either. Hmm. I'm sorry you had that experience, and I'm. I'm yeah, it's okay. I have a habit of setting up <laughs> environments. Hmm. Um. Well, we have about ten minutes left um, to leave that line open. Is there anything people are interested in talking about um, in terms of new code contributions or about public labs specifically? I'm wondering I, if someone, okay, I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, does anyone have any questions? Actually, I have a question. <laughs> That's like something I would do. <laughs> now no one feels like they can talk. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just make you to ask your questions, Stevie. Yeah, okay. I, I was wondering um, if, 
like when when you came to the the plots on, on github on public lab um did you did you were you interested in to look at the website as well and learn more about public lab or is it did you remain mostly on github um to go through the problem um i'm curious about like the people who are contributing are they also visiting the website and, and learning up and like is that part of the reason why people get involved or is it um, strictly related on, on GitHub? So I, I will say uh, I, I really liked what the project was about, but I felt an onus not to spend too much time on the site itself because uh, you know they teach you like when you're learning to draw like if you're learning to draw a face, you shouldn't think about things as eyes and noses. You should think about them just as lines. Cool. So I find when I'm working on a website, if I know too much about what it looks like in the front, I get confused when I'm looking at the back end. Uh. So uh, that's just me though. And that's just the first time thing. I've spent more time on the site now. But initially, um, I thought it was cool, um, like what the, what the site was about. That did um, increase my interest in the project. Cool. That's actually a pretty good analogy. Uh, even I didn't, yeah, I, I looked more at the code than I did uh, on the website. I signed up and I looked through and everything, but still I have, uh, I opened the plots repository at least like three or four times during the day to like go through all the issues and comments, but not the website as much. Mm -hmm. 